previously on Discography. So to me, for me, it's quite simple. It's Wowie Zowie is, is the most entertaining of the pavement records to me. Um, Santa and Shannon, just because it's, it would be second, just because it's such a, a landmark record. An easy third is Bright in the Corners. A handful of my all-time favorite songs, both live and, and recorded, are on that. It was a great experience. And then I would unquestionably say Crooked Rain is my fourth favorite. And then my least favorite is, is Terror Twilight. Welcome to Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and if you're tuning in for the first time, well, I just quit my job while putting the Pavement series together, because I do just about everything here, from obtaining the guests, to doing all the social media, all the recording and editing, you name it. And I love it. Currently, I'd have it no other way. The last six weeks of my career as a hearing instrument specialist was spent literally editing and promoting the Pavement series eight and a half hours a day, nonstop, until there was nothing left to do but leave. So why am I telling you this? Because I'm doubling down on Discography. My wife and three-year-old son are doubling down on Discography. We're selling our house and planning on living as cheaply as possible on the East Coast, and all of that just to ensure that Discography is the standard bearer for all that's awesome about music. So don't go anywhere when this episode's done. Subscribe. Coming up, we have two weeks of Lou Barlow rating the zombies, then an unprecedentedly intimate interview with the man, then three weeks of Jim Florentine rating Black Sabbath, two weeks of Randy Randall from No Age rating Jesus Lizard, and on and on and on, way, way into the future. Here's what I'd love for you to do. Check out all the back episodes. Trust me, they're all as good as the one you're about to hear. Share the ones you dig with your friends, post them all on your various pages and accounts, and tag me on the posts. I promise to join in on the musical merriment. Also, join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter, too, in case you don't mess with Zuckerberg. Also, please rate the podcast five stars, along with a beautifully worded review, especially if you're listening to the show on good old Amazon Music, or, of course, Spotify. It'll help a lot. The link to our legendary playlist is in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. And if you're like me, and enough's just never enough, then visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Our Patreon feed is the ultimate music deep dive. I post three shows a week. The main show on Sunday, then Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major on Tuesdays, and a Thursday wildcard episode, which is either an interview with that week's guest or one of our other offshoot shows like Rock Cousteau, Queasy Listening, and Battle Royale. So hey, try it for a month. You've got nothing to lose. Okay, back to business. First things first, you guys need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography's heavily researched and the music's always reassessed with fresh ears. We're not just covering albums. Uh Uh-uh, I do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between zero and five, which allows us all to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. In this episode of Discography, we'll be turning our spray cans on the zombies. Minor key purveyors of breathy pop sads turned, well, at least they had the 60s. What, what, but wait, I actually procured a minor key purveyor of breathy pop sads to ascend Mount Zombie with us. Most famously, a founding member of Massachusetts hardcore band Deep Wound. He's also lent his talents to such peripheral hobbyist acts as Dinosaur Jr. and Sebado, not to mention Folk Implosion, Centrido, and his own solo material, which you can find on an endless breadcrumb trail of shrimper releases and otherwise. Famously suffering from 
the kinds of emotional issues the rest of us soldiers of sound just call a Monday. The difference between tonight's guest and you is that he flipped his Tascam 4 track on and kick-started a songwriting revolution. Our guest's work in this medium stands objectively as some of the most powerful music ever made. All of it. Weed Forreston, Freedman, The Original Losing Losers, Sebado 3, et al. I own it all. Every last fucking EP and single. His work in Dino alone is astounding. His bass work, a full frontal assault that buttresses famous chanting long-haired Jay Maskus's shrieking wild animal guitar work and Murph's pounding backbeat. I wrote a part for him in a movie I never completed when I was 22 years old because I was a wild-eyed fanboy at heart, but now I'm in the latter stage of my life, and so while he's just a guy to me, he's a very special guy and a truly nice one at that, but man, he used to masturbate a lot as a young man. But hey, you do what you gotta do, and I did too, sometimes up to six times a day, uh, because uh, I actually wasn't able to achieve climax until I was 15 years old, which was extremely worrisome if you really want to know the truth. Lads and ladies out there in the twilight reaches of Discography Village, would you please welcome to the show the greatest man to ever tune a guitar in fifths, Luby, a.k.a. Lou Barlow. Hi. Hey, man. <laughs> hey. How the hell are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm better now. That was amazing. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You, you really, I'm just going to just lay all my fucking cards out on the table. You mean a lot to me. You always have, and your work always has your uh, your cadences and uh, unique idiosyncratic ticks in this medium. All mean a lot to me, and so thank you. You're fucking welcome. <laughs> okay, so you have fans who are like your, you know, let's say for lack of a better terminology, just for the moment, your harmacy fans or your, you know, uh, bake sale fans, right? Then you got your like crazy people. Who are you, like your Freedman Weed Forreston fans? Maybe you don't see us that way, but how do you view the people who uh, that part of your career had a special impact on? You're my friend. Huh. My friends. I made friends that way. Yeah. I made Weed Forreston actually brought me John Davis, uh, Bob Fay, um, um, my my first wife actually was like kind of a Polito weed forest and and then she pierced the veil because you were writing songs about her during that period right no i mean i didn't no i mean i i met her in 87 so i had already kind of done weed forest and and probably but yeah like going into the freed man yeah actually we were we were living together when i was completing the freed man with eric Gaffney, but yeah, I don't know. That was that that record was my it was my uh, I don't know what it was just like a little flyer I put up like I need friends. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, man, it, we went through, by the way, so many iterations of possibilities. Remember when you were demanding to do Taylor Swift? I uh, Yes. <laughs> Talk to me about I didn't demand. I didn't demand to do Taylor Swift. No, I know. I know. I, I'm <laughs> being hyperbolic, but tell me about the intention behind that. Uh, because I, I listen to I, I I I listen to Taylor Swift all the time because I have a sick a very very dictatorial six year old <laughs> who controls so you- almost everything I listen to in a car. So. I mean, almost all the time. I mean, I, I said it to my wife today. I was like, you know, when it comes down to it, like 75% of the day, there is a Taylor Swift song in my head. If I'm not actually, li- you know, listening to it, I'm. it's just in my head. And my little girl will come home like she did today and she'll just start, she's singing Taylor Swift. So then it triggers it again. And it's just this constant, I mean, it's just. To be fair, I, I'm not in- entirely familiar with her work, but I've I've actually heard she's unironically very good. So I didn't know if you were trying to do a piss take or if you. No, I I think she's very. Ta- I think Taylor Swift is immensely talented. That's I mean, what I've heard. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know if I need to hear her for a while. I probably right. could take I could probably could take a break, but it's not really up to me. We haven't hit on that magical thing yet. There's a magical choice to be made here, and it hasn't come up yet. 
and this is the this is really a perfect one uh because that minor key thing i'm guessing whether it was a conscious or unconscious choice these guys really informed what you did right um they were i listened to them all the time i mean kind of early on you know from i i was introduced to them and uh and I mean, Jay introduced them to me in 1985. So, it was like just just as just as we formed Dinosaur Junior, it was kind of part of my like, like okay, we're gonna we're doing this band. You know, we're we're not deep wound anymore. We're going to, we're going forward. We're going to become this right. this rock band. And one he was like, and you have to buy Time of the Zombies, and I did. It was kind of like my I bought like Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits Volume One, you know that double record, and then I bought Time of the Zombies and uh, volume, volume Two, Volume Two, and that's record. got that that awesome um, uh, all that shit that he did with uh, with Leon Russell is on there, like watching the river flow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'd never, I had just, I had never really listened to Dylan before that, and uh, yeah, and the Zombies. It was. Wow. So that your introduction to Dylan came at the exact same time that uh, your debut release on Homestead came out. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, well, 85. I mean, I'm, when we were when we. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, yeah, I guess I, let's. Yes. Yes. You're right. Because I mean, it, we're talking a matter of like maybe six months or something. But what did they mean to you? I mean, was it an immediate thing where you fell in love or was it a slow, a slow burn? No, it was immediate. I mean, I'd already known the hits, you know, I mean, you, these guys aren't your favorite band, are they? Um, no. Okay. Do you have a favorite band? I don't know. Yeah. You don't I have, mean, a, I, you have a favorite album? Um, <laughs> have you outgrown the need for lists? I have, well, I don't know if I've outgrown it. I just don't have time for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I'm also really, I'm always, I'm always kind of, I've always been more interested in music. I haven't heard right, than, music, right. than music I've heard. Yeah. So that kind of that makes me kind of restless i guess i don't want to but i mean i i come back to the zombies i come back to, to the music machine yeah 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 and i come back to neil young you know and uh and i mean dozens and dozens of other things but i i i don't know having listened to them you know going revisiting them i was i mean i am i just i think that the first run of I, mean, I don't know i just to me almost every single zombie single <laughs> is yeah. amazing like i mean i just really i really do i am still just astounded by how like they don't have it's not like i just i do love them more than the who you know i i, I although i don't like to really compare bands either because i love all bands i mean i yeah, love yeah. you know i love all that stuff and i don't really but jay used to jay was very uh outspoken about the zombies and would insist that they were better than the Beatles, which I couldn't quite agree with, but I, yeah, yeah. but at the same time, I'm like, I don't know. There are moments, the zombies, the, there is something about the zombies that is so I, at their perfect. Best, there's a sophistication that doesn't feel, uh, that feels very organic and doesn't, exactly. it doesn't feel like they're trying to wow you. It feels like they right. have all this music knowledge. That's all, that's all it is. It's not, they're, they're like, and that's what I was thinking. Like for such a band that could be so arch sounding and I, mean, I guess they did, they could sound that way maybe in their latter year, the very well, they later, went they definitely they went, went there, but for how they just, I don't know how it's like, you're saying they were so sophisticated, but so, uh, unpretentious yeah. and that, and that, that's something that that I, I I do every time I hear that I, I hear that first you know seven or eight singles of theirs or whatever I mean it's like I still to the I mean like I love every second of it I can that run is amazing it's almost a separate career from the one that they had with uh Odyssey and Oracle which yeah is Odyssey amazing. and the Oracle is like not I think listening to you know going back now and listening to it, it's like that I really I don't I no, I, I did recognize that um, Odyssey and Oracle was, a, I didn't really know it was a separate album at first because it was on Time of the Zombie. So it was like this. Right, right. So I didn't know, I mean, it sort of mentions it in the liner notes, but I, did, I wasn't really aware of it. Um, but uh, That's where it started for me. I had heard, obviously, the two or three hits on the radio, but, um, but when somewhere in the mid-90s, when I, Odyssey and Oracle must have been re-released and, uh, and I picked it up. Yeah. And it, and it really blew me away. I mean, you know, a few songs in particular, which 
you know, we'll certainly get to obviously, but, um, but some of the more sprightly tunes on there were just really insane mind blowers for me. And, uh, I wound up loving it despite butcher's tale. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So tonight's episode, the rules are we could be contrarian dickheads about this episode and pick up the strands of singles and B-sides and reorder the entirety of their output, but that would make me an asshole librarian. Instead, in a break from the norm, uh, with Lou's approval, we're going to consider uh, everything in in order of the singles. Um, and we're going to do like, instead of top three albums, we're going to do top three singles uh, and keep it like truly in a... 45cat.com kind of a kind of a vibe cool. um does that sound good <clears throat> yeah then let's uh, let's launch out of the gate here here's a little segment that i love to call the run-up and this gets us as quick as possible in an auctioneer voice kind of way to the first ever release from the band so our story begins in 1961 three members of the band rod argent paul atkinson and hugh grundy they first came together to jam in st albans hertfordshire uh, Argent wanted to form a band and initially asked Jim Rodford, who is his older cousin, to join as a bassist. Uh, Rodford was in a, a band called the Blue Tones, which was a successful local act um, at the time, and so declined, obviously not owning a crystal ball, but he offered to help Argent. And in 2004, when the band reformed, Rodford would later join. Uh, Colin Blundstone and Paul Arnold joined the other three to form the band in April 1962. Their original name was the Mustangs, but they realized there were other groups with that name. Uh, and just like uh, the situation that you guys ran into, right? Um, Back in 85? <laughs> that's right. With yeah. the, um, uh, the dinosaurs from San Francisco, which had members of Country Joe and the Fish and maybe Quicksilver. I'm not sure, but uh, the fish sued us. It was, for, a, for it was a blessing in disguise because Dinosaur Jr. is a better band than it is. <laughs> uh, so uh, when Argent was asked about the origins of the band's name in, a, in an interview with Pop Matters in 2015, uh, he said it was, it was Paul Arnold, the original bass guitarist, that came up with the name. I don't know where he got it from. He very soon left the band after that. So we mm. gave them a cool fucked up name and split. Arnold <laughs> lost interest in the band, chose to leave to become a doctor. Uh, he was replaced by Chris White. That's obviously a good decision in hindsight. This is the band we've come to know and love. Colin Blundstone, lead vocals, tambourine, guitar. Rod Argent, keyboards, backing and lead vocals, harmonica. Paul Atkinson, guitar. Chris White, bass, backing vocals. Hugh Grundy, drums. We get most of the songwriting done by Rod Argent and Chris White, with some, with some uh, exceptions. So they won. They they won a, a beat group competition that was sponsored by the London Evening News. Signed a recording contract with Decca and recorded their first hit, "She's Not There." It was released in mid '64, peaked at number twelve in the UK. Uh, which oddly, I don't know if you know this, Lou. You probably do. It was their only UK top forty hit. They were not a big British thing. Yeah. I did know that. <laughs> because their music is overcast, just like the fucking sky out there. I don't know why they weren't able to put two and two together. The tune began to catch on in the U.S., though, immediately, and eventually climbed to number two in early December, sold over a million copies. Phase one, the undisputed kings of the haunting minor key beat era pop scene, 1964 to 65. First of all, grab an LP cover and look at these guys. Young, harmless, white college guys, yet with a slight yet detectable psychedelic gleam in yonder eyes. So, July 64, uh, She's Not There, backed with You Make Me Feel Good. That's their first single. Uh, both of them were recorded on June 12, 1964. Uh, the A side is Rod Argent, B side is Chris White. I'm stepping aside. Lou, talk to me. <clears throat> That's amazing. <laughs> It's one of the greatest records ever released. It really is. She's not there, and I love you. Make me feel good. Yeah, yeah, they're a both, lot. Yeah, they're both. Yeah, they're <laughs> really good. You make me feel good is sort of like a. She's not there is not like a Beatle thing, but you make me feel good is sort of like their own, you know, unique take 
maybe more slightly more sophisticated on the sort of mercy uh, vibe, but it's not pastiche. It's it's so good. I don't know. This is what I'm gonna. <laughs> So what I'm gonna do the whole time. I'm like, yep, it's amazing. Okay. No, you know what? I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep picking at this zit until I pop you. My <laughs> <friend>. <laughs> um, you know, actually, okay. Let's let's first hone in on you. Make me feel good. Mm. So it is beetly, but more to the point, perhaps more uh, like. And this is actually becoming before the formation of the group. Kind of has more of a Bo Brummelly thing to it. Yeah, they they actually have a lot. There's there is a lot of similarities between them and the Bo Brummels, like their use of twelve string, uh, and the, I mean, although there's a, I, I, I just but they're they're better. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. better than I love the Bo Brummels. You know, I love I, I love I mean, the Bo the, the first you know few singles by them are incredible, but this, but I don't know I, the way that they sound as a band. They sound like a really good band like the way they play yeah. together they sound like they practiced a lot they sound like they're enjoying like there's the drums are are snappy there's you can tell that that's and what i really like about it too is that you don't think about who produced the record like so many times when i listen to 60s records i think well who produced this because you know that right. some some producer put their thumb on this and like made the mark and made the sound but i feel like the zombies like they made their sound they didn't like there is no there is not this like do you know what i'm saying like yeah like like george martin really did shape the beatles like he shaped them i mean the songs obviously are tremendous and but the recordings the recording and the recording style is is really a, a huge part of what made the beatles like just absolutely undeniable but the thing that's so cool about i find about the zombies is that they really do have this kind of like garage band feel to the recordings and it doesn't yeah. and i never i never think i don't even know who produced those records and that is it is odd that i yeah, don't I, because i actually I, don't either and i have 30 pages of notes sitting here in front of me right we don't we it, isn't that yeah. crazy that we yeah. never we never think of who recorded them whereas any other band we talk about we're going to talk about who who defined this band who was yeah. the who was this this person this of oh, this personality you know assume it you know assume it's an older person you know who who are the who are the lab coats that came in and, right, and put right. the finishing touches on this but when you listen to the zombies it's like it's all about the band like every right. like and i just it, it, it and even she's not there which is such a like a distinctive recording it's like you feel like the reason it's distinct is because you know colin lent and lent like sort of you know uh you know, leaned into the mic a certain way, and you feel like everything that they did was because of their touch. Everything, yeah. everything that shapes them is because of the way they played it. And even if you listen to the the demos and like other recordings of these songs or or, or whatever, it's like they it, they still sound the same. It has I don't know, and it it is it is odd to me that we don't know who produced it. And that it is so much. They they were so much. They they were responsible. They were their own producers, you know, which is but incredible. Also, but think this through. If if you were if you were producer at that time, and these kids come in, I'm guessing the first thought is, um, I'm going to put my thumbprint all over these fucking sons of bitches. And then as soon as they start, you just the only reaction is to get out of the way because they probably knew more than whoever was producing them. What? Maybe not about recording, but about music theory. And I mean, there's, it, they really knew that you could tell they knew their shit. Yeah, I, I don't know. Even... They were cocky as fuck because like what you were saying, the, the drums being snappy, uh, there is a snap, but there's also this very cocksure, lazy saunter that's a couple millimeters behind the beat. And that jazz influence uh, yeah. is what took them right out of the Beatles class and in a world of their own. Well, they just, they sounded like they were so comfortable in a room together to me too. Yeah. That, and like, they just sounded, yeah, I, 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 I don't, I, it, it still is remarkable to me. Yeah. The, uh -huh. the, um, you know, Argent's electric piano sound, the, uh, the Honer, is it pronounced P and A or, uh, is, um, it's got a very distinctive, uh, tone to it. And also the backing vocals, uh, it's a very uh, like folk influenced close harmony style 
uh, mm-hmm. that adds another element to it that that takes it into its own uh, its own class. It, this is a hard one for them to top. This is a tough first single, right? Because you know you throw down your gauntlet and then you realize that now the biggest problem in the world that you have is to top a perfect single. <laughs> so I give this single four five stars unquestionably. Absolutely. All right, good. I'd, yeah. I'd hate to have to resort to Fistica. <laughs> All right, yeah. so. Uh, October 1964, they record Leave Me Be, which is a Chris White song, backed with Woman, which is an Argent song. Okay, so let me just say that Leave Me Be is my favorite zombie song. Oh. Does that disappoint you? No. I That's wanna, great. Does Leave Me Be, is it is affecting for you as it is for me, or am I just that guy? I love, I love it. I yeah, love it. I feel like this is where Chris White really just kind of explodes out because because woman is not it's like the rare kind of mediocre song by them. Well, it's a B side. That sounds like a real B side. You know, it's like well, man, that that. But even that's it's not that bad. It's like a great. That's a great. The, the I love woman. Actually, I love that song too because I love I love the drumming on it. But leave me be, I think is, is is so. That's really special. It is, and I don't know. Now I first heard that song. Um, I didn't know it was the zombies. I because that one came to me later. Um, I first heard it by a group called the Choir. Do you know the oh, Choir? Oh God! Oh, I love the Choir. Yeah, I love the Choir. So. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I like them better than the raspberries. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I can't say enough about that version. Uh, that is really why um, I think it's the best song that Chris White's ever written. So their popularity is growing, obviously, much more in the U.S. Uh, and, this, and the zombies managed to, uh, you know, to get a lot more bookings and gigs. And obviously, less time now could be wasted doing something as trifling as writing songs. So... So that's why Chris White stepped up to the plate um, mm. as a substitute for Argent doing everything. So <clears throat> in July to August of 64, uh, he wrote this, uh, like a big batch of tunes that were intended for singles and albums and stuff. And so that's what Leave Me Be came out of. Mm. Um, but um, I don't know if you know this, but they always kind of regretted going with the singing style that they have in there. Um, The final version of Leave Me Be has this sort of breathy whisper, Mm. Um, but the original one had a a less somber tone to it. Mm. And they always preferred that, which is odd to me because the breathy whisper is what takes it over the top for me. Oh yeah. This one I give, um, I give a five, even though I don't think, I think woman's a good song, not a great song, but uh, I definitely give the single five stars. Yeah, I would too. I don't. I don't know. Like I would say, like you know, she's not there. Could be six, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. it would be five. You know, right, right. Well, these first, know. these first three are just you know, they're you can't. It's very hard to find fault. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's it for sixty four, and then we head into January nineteen sixty five. The third single, "Tell Her No" on the A side um, uh, by Argent backed with what more can i do by white Mm. this one um hit number six in the u.s in march 65 um and was one of the big three triumvirate in a row um and it was only a minor hit in in england where it peaked at 42. it's wild Um, yeah (laughs) yeah it's, it's insane to me um but uh the word no is mentioned 63 times in the lyrics yeah. Have you ever heard that? I don't, I don't remember the name of the garage band, but there's something on a compilation. There's actually, they, there's a whole compilation named no, no, no. And it's all these sort of minor chord garage bands. And there's a song called like, it's like, no, 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 no. No, I don't know. That one. <laughs> it's amazing. Awesome. It's like, it's like they, they totally copy. It's like, but it's, it's this wonderful, like really murky garage zombies rip off, you know, like these kids like trying to be the zombies and it's, Fucking great. That is awesome. I'll check it. Are there Ramon songs on there too? No. What? 
No. Well, because, you know, the early Ramon stuff is like, I don't want to go down to the basement. I don't want to do this. I don't... <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's all willful negation. Right. Um, that sounds all... What is the name of that comp? I got to get that. It's No, I think it's just like, no, no, no. No, no, no comp. All right. Yeah. yeah. All and I think they actually, there's another one, uh, like a companion comp called like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's like got 30 songs on it or something. Yeah. You know, sort of back from the grave, uh, pebble style. But. It's awesome. It sounds very snotty and bratty. According to Argent, this was actually, <laughs> Teller No was, uh, was kind of a Burt Bacharach, Hal David deal. Hmm. That's kind of what he was uh, what he was going for as far as uh, a sphere of influence. Totally a classic. Uh, and this time, I think the B side is uh, totally up to snuff. It doesn't it doesn't sound like a B side to me. And most of their B sides don't. So this one, obviously, five stars. Yep. All right. I agree. Now, <laughs> now, so do you know about uh, the Zombies EP from the same month? No. What OK, so. It's uh, one of those, uh, you know, 45 RPM EPs. So it's mm. uh, two songs on the on the first side, two on the second. Kind of girl, sometimes it's all right in summertime. Okay. So, you know, I'm guessing you know them, right? Or you know, uh, yeah. You know summertime, obviously. Oh, of course, uh, yeah. But. So kind of girl <clears throat> is really the first song that um, that is like one of those rare tracks from that time that kind of misses the mark for me. So the the Zombies EP thing, it's uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a grab bag. Um, like I said, Kind of Girl is not the greatest Argent song of all time. Um, sometimes is a real great, that's a great sleeper. This is kind of a weird one because it's got wandering, almost, uh, almost like a prog-like labyrinth and pop melody. Mm -hmm. But then somewhere you're kind of belched out into a totally convincing blues transition. Right. <laughs> it's, it's very uh, unique for them. It's so dramatic. <laughs> like, kind of guy. It's so <laughs> just teenager. Um, <laughs> I like kind of girl. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, it's, it kind of makes me laugh because it's so strident and over hysterical. Well, I, it, it just, for some reason, the I, somehow the Ramones popped into my head just because it's like it's like they had a sound. So it's like anything they you know like the Ramones could you know I I loved every Ramones song you know for the first yeah. four four album albums like right. every song you know you're not like oh, I don't like this song no it's like no every song is great because it's the yeah. Ramones and they play it and they play it in the Ramones style and it's you know, kind of like Black Black Sabbath is like that as well and the Zombies kind of have that thing where it's just like. Right. Yeah, this it's not one of their best tunes, you know, but I love that it's but it's but because to me they do have this kind of garagey feel to it. It's like, well, you know, they're just throwing shit at the wall, see what sticks, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. I'm, well, I mean, pretty much all of it stuck, <laughs> you know. I mean Yeah, I like look, a, a when you're shocking trying, amount of it stuck. When you try to find it. fault with the with the zombies catalog, it's very difficult up until a certain point and then it's very easy um <laughs> <laughs> so then uh after sometimes uh arjun throws down a song called it's all right which is um totally perfunctory in my eyes uh the kind of thing that Argent was probably shitting out in his sleep at that point you know if you set the bar that high right out of the gate then that's the standard i gotta you but know. the thing is though that even those like if, if those were on a pebbles record i'd love it yeah i know i know, you know what i mean that's yeah. that's the the the, the level of because I mean, the, the zombies were also like, after I got into the zombies, and I, I really got into 60s music and then discovered Pebbles and Back from the Grave. And so my 60s obsession became just became so deep. And so like, like, you know, you just you, you love us, you, you could love a whole song just because of the, the bass pedal squeaks all the way through it. Or you could love a whole song because right, right. because you love how the, the, the lead the singers the sing. Front. Like, I remember, uh, uh, is there a term for that when you can hear the fingers on the fretboard? Annoying. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily think it is, but it's not necessarily annoying. I, there's at me, really when I record, when I record or some, I'm, I'm saying it's annoying to me because when I record, right. if I find like something like that and you, because I have to list, I listen to things over and over again, you know, finalizing them and it, things like that become glaring you know you become when you start to really pick things apart 
um, and focus on on things like that, making music, it becomes annoying. But of course, as a listener, those those kind of idiosyncratic moments are what make the records for you, you know? Those, yeah, those organic uh, yeah, and, become like, you know, it sounds wrong if you take them away. Yeah, and I, I mean, to me, the lesser zombies are still, I mean, totally. like you said, yes. you know, especially the early, I just, the early stuff I don't, I just, it it just kind of all thrills me every time i can't i have a hard time a really hard yeah, time no, look, separating I, <laughs> no I, short of saying look i'm just trying to find some fault in some stuff just to keep this show dramatically interesting <laughs> i do want to say that like re, you know relative to everything that they did there's degrees of zombie greatness that are uh you know that are absolutely uh, inassailable and then mm-hmm. others that are you know like woman or it's all right where it's yeah. kind of brave up uh, yeah they're normal they're like they, like, they become normal it's like, like they they yeah you know for example like summertime is it, it's an astounding piece of work i mean how many versions of summertime are there and this one every time i hear it mainly because of colin uh mm-hmm. it's trans completely transportative yep um but Ultimately, look, this is one of those stopgap uh, releases, although the gap is probably like a week in terms of product. Uh, yeah. I'm really not quite sure what the point of the that release is, but uh, the Zombies EP just kind of seems, uh, you know, a little bit commercially vacuous. That being said, if, if it's to be graded on a bell curve, uh sometimes alone is worth the is worth the price of purchase uh even their shit doesn't stink with these guys <laughs> so uh, all right 1965 again uh begin here the first album uh not many albums but this is the first one it's called begin here in the uk and the zombies in the u.s it was recorded from june to december 64 came out in january 65. so this is kind of a an amalgam of all kinds of different things that they were doing obviously you know singles up to that point were were thrown in you had some r b like kind of faceless r b workouts um you know it's a it's a hodgepodge but it's it's awesome i think as time has gone on uh this one has wound up coming to the fore a little bit for me and uh been neck and neck or even you know even topping odyssey and oracle for me at times Mm. do you come back to this one a lot or or i never leave yeah (laughs) yep yep i kind of i kind of don't ever leave (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) Yeah. look you got you got stuff like roadrunner got my mojo working i mean these are things that just like um you know the song baby what you want me to do like i I hope to God I never have to hear any of these songs ever again, ever. But uh, I mean, what are club standards with no bearing on the on the on the dazzling fruit that were being born forth from these geniuses at that time? If it's the price uh, to pay to hear all those amazing songs, then whatever. Uh, but ultimately, it's it's hard to rate this one, seeing as it's all over the damn map and serves so many masters at once. At the end of the day, there's too much greatness to let the lands of a thousand dances impinge. I give it four stars. The zombies begin here. It's four yeah. stars. Yeah, I think that's a f- I, yes. <laughs> Damn you, Lewis. I <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you. And I'm not going to say I'm not going to say three because I don't think it's it's definitely no, no, not a three. I know. And it's so, not a five. It's not a five, really, because it's not it's not it's not among the greatest debut records of the 60s. I mean, it's not like it's not uh, turn on the music machine, which is my favorite. My yeah. favorite debut album of the you know, mid 60s. But uh, I love Double Yellow Line, man. And the eagle oh. never crushes the fly. Holy shit. That's sh- that's later. See, that's later. That's like 67. Like 66 yeah, yeah. Music Machine or 65 actually. I'm not sure, but uh Actually the the film that I'm currently setting up is about a uh, psych rock band in the late 60s and yep. uh the detail from the Music Machine that I use is since they're all turning into werewolves, they need to hide their hands. So they all wear one they all wear a black glove. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so um, 
Let's talk about these songs. Let's go through this. So uh, we've talked about some of them, but any album that kicks off with a version of Roadrunner by Bo Diddley, you know, it might have some catching up to do uh, right out of the gate. So it is a spirited version of the song, but, you know, real talk, it's elevated filler with some sick shredding guitar work slathered on it. It's funny, but it's, to me, a little bit sad when uh, when this hits you in the face after becoming accustomed to the genius run of those those first several hits. Oh, yeah. All the, all the bands had to do that back then. Yeah. They were, all, they were all forced to do things. I mean, the Music Machine had to do like a Neil, Neil Diamond cover. Or... What did they have to do? Uh, Cherry Cherry. Did, oh, yeah. They did a very, I, I think it's a great version. Yeah, but, I mean, but Neil <laughs> Diamond is awesome, though. Neil Diamond is amazing, but I'm just... They didn't want to do any covers. Right, right. I don't I I forgive the zombies for Roadrunner. I don't know. I don't yeah, think yeah, it's totally. that. <laughs> totally. The, but this is look, this is to me and, and and sometimes when I'm putting together my my notes and going through the trawl, listening to the music, um you know, it's difficult for me not to kind of step into the person's shoes and just kind of uh it's almost like virtual reality trying to see the one that I always come back to is forever changes so it loves forever changes in my mind there's this image i have of mm. uh arthur lee waving goodbye outside your front door and you shut the door and that's forever changes like this guy saying goodbye and so mm. <clears throat> then a couple of years later you open the door he's still there waving goodbye <laughs> <laughs> so it's like uh, i well, i, I <laughs> that's really to, sweet <laughs> anyway it's uh so it's hard for me not to kind of step in and um and ask myself i know i'm a great songwriter i you know the songs are doing great in america and all these things and yet still there's pressure for me to hew to a certain way or you know i don't i don't know i i never see the zombies complaining ever i don't know for some, maybe they uh -huh. did but I, but I don't see I, to, to to me I could see them just like yeah let's let's play our because there's so much there's so much joy that comes out in the the playing of these every song on the on the record really in the covers especially the, the way they dig into they do great covers like they really dig into them they yeah. dig in they, like I imagine them playing like okay so they won a battle of the bands you know to get their record contract I imagine them i imagine that roadrunner was like maybe one of the first songs they played and they played it for dances because that's what you had to do you know so when they play it i imagine them i imagine like you know girls dancing to it i, I imagine them in like yeah. this little like a, a little you know club in a club hall somewhere you know some kind of youth <laughs> I don't like know a, what. Like a sock hop, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the, the like some sort of English whatever their version of uh, you know the dance hall. Yeah. You know, and just these kids, you know, just these, uh, yeah, I mean, middle class English kids, like sort of, you know, dancing kind of awkwardly. And but the zombies, you know, as a band, just clicking as they did, they just clicked. Like, like everything is just so, so all of the, the music is so alive inside. The way it all moves, all the way the parts all move together, they just, there's just so much joy in it that, like, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I know that they were all for. I mean, the early Beatles records to me are kind of full of terrible covers. So I'm never I so, really. I really love them. Actually, I, I I'd never I'd never liked the covers on. I didn't. I thought they were kind of clunky. You know, yeah. I didn't. I just. I'd never. I thought. I thought. I thought the Beatles. The way that the Beatles covered stuff was clunky to me. I mean, not you know maybe with the obvious you know exceptions but the very early like the very first you know beatles record the very i found yeah, it kind of yeah. clunky i found them kind of clunky there's nothing yeah. there's the zombies are like and that's so one thing i also love about the beatles is actually that they were kind of oddly i mean just it was so simple like from a ringo standpoint or whatever but this but like q grundy the drumming on the zombie stuff is like really like really cool i mean it's all yeah. really really alive and moving around and like lots of tom work and cool symbol stuff i mean it's it's and that's the other thing about them not really having a producer you know it's like it's not over compressed nothing is like you know it's like it's all kind of breathing and moving yeah so i've i've you know i forgive zombies their covers more than i forgive a lot of bands <laughs> other bands at that time for, for theirs you know 
Well, just uh, to provoke uh, intense drama, uh, I'm I'm absolutely recalcitrant in my unforgiving stance. <laughs> but let's talk about a couple songs that uh, that have not crossed our paths via uh, forty five quite yet. Uh, you have the, you know, the covers that we talked about. You have all the singles that have come down the pike and that are sort of being an anthologized and collected here on Begin Here. But also there are a couple other tunes. I Don't Want to Know by Chris White, I don't believe has come up on a single before. And <clears throat> it has a, yeah. a stronger birds flavor than is typical for them. And it's good to remember that these guys preceded not just the birds, but the beef eaters. Um, oh yeah so and also another one i remember when i loved her that oh, is probably the big standout for me from the record because yeah. it's so minor key it's downright spooky and uh it's got like this sort of flamenco psych folk vibe to it which is very unique finally they get a record out there it's it's not five stars but what are you gonna do life isn't perfect uh april 1965 we have she's coming home uh, which is an argent song and i must move which is a white song on the b-side mm. so this is what uh lou doesn't want to face this fact but this is just <clears throat> an ineffable zombies related fact so uh, the group was primarily focused on the American market at the, at the time, which makes obvious sense because the UK wanted nothing to do with them for some odd reason. Uh, Parrot Records uh, quickly released this single in March 65, um, but She's Coming Home only became a mid-sized hit and it didn't, it didn't break the top 40. So uh, this is in April of 65, it failed to chart and honestly that can really be considered the starting point of the group's declining commercial success which then sort of impacted them as far as the kinds of material they were uh being directed towards doing mm. are you a fan of this one yes i really like this one yeah it's like an r&b song it's not it's a it's kind of more of a more class it, it doesn't have the it's not like the zombie sound of their first you know batch of singles but it's but it actually they but they had they had such a love for like r b that kind of like classic they, yeah. you know like the way that they went on to cover like get a hold of myself and going out of my head like right right it's kind of in that style you know so it's like this classic uh i don't know like this classic pop and maybe a little more maybe kind of faceless a little bit compared to their earlier stuff but i love it though because i i just because i love the band so this is this is a um one that i was less familiar with i hadn't heard this a hundred thousand times um and i think there's more inherent drama that's packed in she's coming home than is typical for them like a little trickly rhythmed specter pocket symphony yeah exactly that's exactly it also what i'm not a musician what does the, the time signatures not that i would expect you to have this charted but uh the bridge into the chorus is extremely <laughs> tricky i mean especially for that era they're as good as the wrecking crew or there is i mean they're yeah. like they're like you know they're actually functioning as like a studio band but they are the band <laughs> it's, like, right. it's, it's them right. and then what that's the other thing that really strikes me about it is it's like and it kind of reminds me of, I was thinking about it today. It reminds me of indie rock in some ways, like, you know, cause you could have these indie rock bands that were, I wish I, I I'm not going to be able to rail off a bunch of examples, but there's a lot of precocious, you know, indie rock bands that were like, could very play incredibly well. And like, and they were, and to me, like, I, again, like I get this real sense of the zombies just entertaining themselves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't, I don't even have the idea that like, they're, they're making this song that sounds like a Spectre song because they're just like, Hey, let's make a song that sounds like a Spectre song. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let's do this. And like, it's, and it sounds like, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about, you know, I don't know if there's any books about the drama behind the scenes with the zombies, but I just, I never, you know, you don't get that. I just don't, but it's I don't not, feel it's not music. drama. It's not look, I'm right now I'm putting together notes for a massive Black Sabbath episode. And that that's all drama. Uh, you know, these guys didn't really have any drama. It was really just um, 
not not anything overwhelming. It was really just, um, you know, the drama of staying true to your muse versus, you know, just cranking out stuff to have a career. Yeah, I, they, I don't know. They just it sound it, the the thing the, the really interesting thing is that they they can sound like a song like you know she's coming home is actually pretty heavy. You know, it's like kind of a really, yeah. but they step so lightly at the uh, same yeah. time. Yeah, and it just it it really. That's a did, very, very well put. And they, and they, they, and like I said, I just feel like they're, they were entertaining themselves. And like, I feel like when they, I feel like even if they, when they found out that it wasn't a big hit, that they weren't like freaking out. <laughs> I feel like they were probably like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know. Let's, they, I just feel like they just kept jamming, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't like, you know, and they, well, I mean, I, look at all the, look at all the other bands who were doing, uh, who were, you know, creating material that was, you know, similarly downcast that had like this, you know, sadness vibe to it uh, that went nowhere. I mean, one that you and I talked about and they're to me just as good as any other band that ever walked the face of the earth, it, albeit briefly, is the poets. Right. You know, that, yeah. you know, that majestically haunting uh, mid 60s vibe, um, you know, they. <laughs> They came and went super quick, but you know the the zombies are kind of kings of that of that scene. Mm. Um, so she that single, I would definitely give a hard five. Really, hard five stars. Hmm. You hate it? I don't. I would say like four and a half. You know, I don't know if okay. I would go full five. Well, this is not the type of dissent that I'd, I'd imagine. <laughs> I'd imagine something <laughs> much more epochal coming. I mean, I, I, although you know what, though, I love Mo "I Must Move" is my is I, one of my favorite zombie songs. It, yeah, it really is. And like, if, if if not, I don't know. There's something about I, you know, you know me now more than just a few days. There's something about, but it won't do any good now. So I don't know. Maybe it is a five, but I, to me, like. I must move is the A side and the B side is she's coming home like that. Yeah. You know what? I'm a, I, I must move is like, absolutely. I mean, to me, it stands with, it stands with the first four singles. Like I, as, as know, a, or the first, I totally agree. The first was, three, you know, it's like the first three. It's like, if you switched it around, it's like you would, if, if their singles were, you know, she's not there, leave me be, tell her no, I must move. It would be perfect. It would be like, but, this band making an incredible stylistic statement of their own so unique to them it was them kind of putting on a different suit you know like it wasn't quite yeah. you know it wasn't quite as idiosyncratically them when i was uh, doing my notes you know i've heard this song a bunch of times but um it really hit me in a different way a couple weeks ago when i put it on i put it on at work i do a lot of my listening just you know the show has overtaken the entirety of my life so i'll be <laughs> listening to zombie songs at work and just to let you know, I, you know, I fit hearing aids. So I'm sitting there, you know, in a lab coat, just like uh, most of the producers in the 1960s and um, listening to now Sabbath, which is totally not fitting because, you know, most of the people I meet with are in their eighties and nineties. Phase two, various commercial pivots enacted seemingly as a knee jerk against the sudden unexpected and inexplicable chart decline 1965 to 1967 so leaning away from their audience leaning too far toward them this was a reactive period yet certainly not without its merit and i don't know if this is on purpose or not on purpose but there is a conscious leaning towards and 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 away um june 1965 i want you back again by argent backed with remember when i loved her oh yeah you're right it is a b-side but after the record came out um again by argent so you got argent on both sides there da -da -da. i want you back I, again I don't know that was that I don't know. Yeah, yeah. that's like the, it's almost got this like bluesy it's got a little bit of a bluesy snarl to it you know yeah yeah they're kind of like being it's, it's like yeah it's their i mean there's there's moments on the the album where they're they try to they have a little bit of they try to take a little bit of that swagger on this yeah i, I don't know i like i like one I, of that I, a yeah, lot I, I like this too. <laughs> so it's um 
this was a, a failure for them. I mean, this is a total abject failure for them. So um, it entered uh, it entered Billboard at ninety eight, peaked at ninety five, and then dropped out. Uh, it's you know real jazzy, real swinging. I mean, this is you know possibly the most overtly jazz like song that they've had at this point, mm. and sophisto muso instincts taking over as their commercial prospects start descending into the toilet. So there's a so what it feels like to me is and I love this uh, it's a little bit of Nero fiddling atop the palace while the Rome and their fortunes burn to the ground. I don't think it's one of their best songs, but it swings really hard and um, and it's kind of unique for them. The the B side, remember when I loved her, we already talked about um, <clears throat> and that's one of their most over, underrated songs. Uh, all told, I'm going to have to go with a four star rating for the, this one. Four. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, then September 65, uh, we have Whenever You're Ready, written by Argent, uh, backed with I Love You. I think that one is Chris White. Um, so they came back from their tour in April 65. They found out She's Coming Home had been a chart failure. They were bummed about that. And then I Want You Back Again was even less of a hit. So what happened then was the group's management pressured them <clears throat> to write a commercial song in the style of their earlier singles, which had been hits. So j whenever you're ready is known to be uh, a copycat thingamajig. And it really is, it really is pretty good for a copycat. Um, but that is kind of what it is. So it's not one of my favorite zombies tunes. Um, uh, I do love, I love you though. I think that's a killer Chris White song. That's classic. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about, uh, do you like Whenever You're Ready? Yes. Okay. All right. These guys were selling out. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think they were selling. I, I can't. I, to me, I mean, as, as a 60, I mean, they were lucky to have three hit songs in a row. I mean, that's yeah, I that's actually pretty unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, I don't. I, uh, Talk to me. <laughs> I love whenever you're, I love all these songs. I can't. I can't. Okay. You can, no, look. I, yeah, I, I, it's I, funny. I, I don't. I don't have any. Like I guess I. Ha I have. Unlike most bands, actually, because I do like to read. You know, biographies, and I like to read. I like to read music history. I am. I know almost nothing about what transpired in the zombies you know like i know a lot about the birds i know you know what i mean yeah. i know a lot about the drama i yeah. heard the one sort of anecdote i ever heard about them was that chris white just was like he felt that he wasn't a good enough bass player so he became an accountant <laughs> you're like yeah. yeah and and the way that they play like there's so much confidence in the in the way that they play and intelligence in the way that they play i sort of feel like they were like well i tried the pop star thing but it didn't work out so i moved on you know right, right, <laughs> like, right. i like i just i don't think any of them like slipped into like you know addiction and <laughs> i i don't know maybe they did yeah, i don't I, no i don't think I, I know i don't know if if their lack if their success in any way meant that they they're like they're, they're them blowing up and them them i don't know if it, it altered really altered who they were as people you know i get the sense that they were incredibly stable you know it's not it's not like you know like keith moon or like these people that right. were that were these incredibly mercurial really on the edge and very very insecure people that were tossed into these you know, really out of control, but the, for the zombies to manage being, a, you know, being a top 10 band for their first three singles and being able to manage that and then just still, you know, just kind of just return to the studio and just play the shit out of their songs. It's yeah. like, that's it. it and they're it, still it, doing it. I mean, they're yeah, it's yeah, it, it belies such a, it, it's like it, it, it shows so much confidence to me and so much like stability yeah. and they, and I had this, uh, I guess I'll tell this story now because I um, I was at this the Mojo Music Awards, you know, Mojo Magazine. Near, it was like this was several years ago. Um, Dinosaur Junior were asked to to just to to attend, and with the idea that we were going to give an award to the Pretty Things, and Jay didn't know who the Pretty Things are, so he uh, we didn't get we didn't yeah he we didn't we didn't well he's kind of like a Rolling Stones guy. There's people. I've had tried to have this, this conversation with 
there are people who are just like, I love the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Beatles, and that's it. And you, you, you try to talk about anything else, they're like, I don't, I don't care. You know, you're like, you're like, like they're, they're just, it's very, I mean, and people who have amazing taste, amazing musicians, but they're very like almost Catholic about their, their favorites and their, and it's like, so there's only the Rolling Stones. There is no pretty things, you know, there is no. One of those guys was in, was in both bands, but in any case, go ahead. So so we but we had this we had a table like so there's this little banquet hall and and they sat dinosaur jr with the buzzcocks and i was sitting right next to pete shelley and he and i got like pretty drunk like we drank wine and he was like really really funny like he's from manchester so he's got this really heavy mancunian accent and he's just like and i look over to the table next to us and the zombies are at the table next to us and I said, and I go like, oh my God, the zombies are at the table next to us. And Pete Shelley says, who? <laughs> and I said, the zombies. He's like, I have no idea who they are or what you're talking about. And I'm like, I'm like, how can that be? I said, really? Like, you don't know who the zombies are, which actually makes sense now that we're talking about it because, right. um, because the English people didn't care about <laughs> the zombies. Like a cult but I, I was like, oh my God, it's them. And so when the zombies, they were awarded, they got some sort of lifetime award and they were all dressed in suits and they stood up simultaneously. They stood up in line, right? And Pete Shelley goes like, oh my God, he's, he's like, oh, they look like a record cover. Mm-hmm. And I looked at them, I look up and they, they were, they were perfectly poised, like just like one of the records, like all just standing <laughs> in a line and Pete Shelley still having no idea who they were. And I'm just like, I'm weighing it to myself because I'm to me, one like an English band that I would equate to the Zombies, you know, as far as the singles go, and of course, like that also their defining record for me, the Buzzcocks defining record for me is Singles Going Steady, yeah. which is very similar to the, the Zombies record. So I have I equate the two so close in my mind, and I was like sitting with Pete Shelley looking at the Zombies, and I realized that I, I could have I could have. If, if I had only thought of it, like seized the moment at some point and taken Pete Shelley to the zombies and introduced them. Oh, that would have been. <laughs> like, if I would have only, if I like, oh my God, like if my one, I mean, like among many regrets in my life, but this one sort of kind of superficial regret, regret is that it's like, my God, to introduce Pete Shelley, one of, I mean, to the other, this other, you know, to, Anyway, it was. That's what is my... the what is the biggest regret though of your life? <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about that. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> oh, and what a horrible place for me to cut in and say, please join us again next week. If you're listening to this in real time, or if you're not listening to this in real time, and you're diving in, and this is a back episode, then by all means. Find out immediately what Lou Barlow's biggest life regret is. Join us for part two when Lou Barlow tackles the zombies from 1966 to present day. And thank you so much for taking this trawl with us as we climb Mount Zombie here on Discography. Discography.